You might have seen I was going to bring a prop on stage called a, a, a little boy because of the feeling of the 5,000 of families and children, but maybe that's a bad idea to have children. Never work with children or animals, they always say in the TV industry. I sort of disagree, but, but there we go. So great. If you've got your Bibles with you, maybe on a phone or a, a physical Bible, which is also great, um, or a tablet or something like that, you can turn to Mark chapter 6. That's where we're going to be camping out today, uh, in Mark chapter 6. We're, we're going to be looking at the story uh, where, where Jesus kind of feeds the multitude, he feeds the 5,000. Now, we're not only going to look at that story, but I want to also look at the story that comes directly after that, not just because um, it's, it's the next story that's reported in Mark's gospel, it, but it, it happens directly after this event. So we're going to look at the two in tandem. So turn there with Mark chapter 6. Um, and just whilst you're doing that, I just want to ask you a question, which is, I guess, how has your week been? Uh, and how are you this morning? How have you come to church this morning? Whether you're, whether you're watching online, whether you're here physically, how are you feeling this morning? Uh, whether you've had a great week, whether you've had a, a bad week. If I've got to be honest, my week hasn't been fantastic. I've had a, I've had a lot on my mind. I've, I feel like I've been tired. I feel like I've been a little bit worn out. I feel like I've been, uh, you know, thinking about too much. Um, you know, to, to, to one point where, where one day this week, I, I actually forgot to, to pick up my four-year-old son from school. <laughs> so, which some of you will be like, oh, what a terrible father. I can't believe he did that. And others are like, oh, well, I do that every week, so it's okay. I realize there's probably a spectrum of, like, you know, good and bad parenting. But, yeah, I mean, I've had so much on my week, uh, so, so much on my mind that I just felt tired. I felt, um, I felt, uh, I felt run down. I felt... Um, like um, I, I was thinking about too much and it was affecting me and it, and it was affecting my decision making and being able to remember key information such as my son uh, and I rocked up 15 minutes late to get him and I had to face the wrath of the school staff you know as they kind of like uh, told me off and I was there with, with my tail between my legs you know I didn't feel like a good father I didn't feel like, a, like a, I was on top form I wasn't performing I wasn't succeeding, and maybe that's how you feel this morning. Uh, I know before you ask, it wasn't because I'm doing too much. It wasn't because we find ourselves um, as a church without a pastor. It wasn't because any of that. It's just because that in all that I've been doing, I haven't been depending on God. I haven't been trusting and relying and, uh, and taking on God's power and God's strength for myself. I've been trying to do it in my own strength. I've been trying to do it in my own wisdom. I've been trying to do it by my own effort. And I've realized this week, and it's been a reminder for me this week, and how much I need to depend on him. That it doesn't matter how able I think I am, I constantly need to depend on him from the, from the small things to the big things. Uh, and that's what we're going to be looking at today. That's what the, I want to give you a reminder of today, that when we, when we look at this passage, it's all about recognizing the power of God and depending on that, learning to rely on that power. So if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to look at Mark chapter 6. And we'll be reading from verse 30. If you haven't got them with you, then that's totally fine. The words will be coming up on the screen as well. So Mark chapter 6 from verse 30. It says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So it says that the apostles gathered around Jesus, telling him all that they had done and taught. And that's effectively because Jesus had just sent them out on their own little mission trip. If you just look back at the start of the chapter in verse 12, it says, They went out, the disciples went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So, so Jesus had sent his disciples, sent his team two by two into the streets, into the villages and the towns, into the countryside to preach the message of the kingdom to preach effectively the gospel, really, even though, you know, in the understanding that they had of it, to, to preach that people should repent, to turn back to God. They healed people. They cast out demons. They did, they did all this great stuff. And now they come back to Jesus at the end of their mission trip, and they're like, whoa, Jesus, it was so awesome. You know, James poured oil on this dude, and he got healed. You know, we, we preached repentance, and people wanted to hear more, and they, and they wanted to turn their lives back around to God. It was awesome. And so his disciples come back around to Jesus, and they want to have some downtime with Jesus. 
Jesus. Now, we've done some mission trips as a church in the past. We've been to Rwanda, we've been to India, we've been to Portugal in, you know, in the years gone by. Um, you know, being on mission, and what, what you know from mission is that when you, when you go out as a team and you, and, you, and, and, and you go out doing stuff for Jesus, and, and, then, you, and then you kind of come back and you, and you might feel a little bit tired, tired, you might feel a little bit worn out, sort of like how I did this week, and you kind of feel like you want some downtime. But even when they come back to Jesus after being out serving and ministering, they come back to Jesus, and that's not what they get. It says that there were so many people coming and going, coming and going that they didn't even have chance to eat. They didn't have chance to eat because so many people were wanting to see Jesus. So many people were wanting to hear Jesus' teaching, were wanting to be healed by him, were wanting to, to, to be ministered uh, to by him. Uh, and, they, and the disciples were so busy serving and ministering and, and helping Jesus in his ministry. Uh, not that he needed that much help, really, was it? Uh, but they, um, they, they didn't even have a chance to eat. They were tired. Um, they, were, they were hungry. But they were willing to serve. They were being stretched. And so Jesus sees this. Jesus sees, hey, guys, you're looking a bit weary. You're looking a bit tired. You're looking a bit hungry. Let's go and find a place to eat. Let's go and find a place to rest. He says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Hey, let's go to that villa up in the mountains. Let, 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 let's, let's go and chill out by the pool. Let's just go and get some downtime, just me and the boys, and, and we'll go and chill out, okay? Now, we know that's not going to happen because we know that they're going to get in a boat, they're going to sail across the lake, and the crowds are going to beat them there. And so they get to the other side of the lake, they step off the boat, and the crowds are there waiting for them. And, and so you can imagine how the disciples might feel. They, they might feel, oh man, come on, give us a break. Give us a break. Like, we just spent ages ministering to you and serving you. You know, we, we didn't even have a chance to eat. We're tired. We're hungry. Um, and, and now we've got to spend time serving you. What's happening here? The disciples are being stretched. The disciples are being stretched. Jesus is allowing them to, to, to enter into, into a time where it's, uh, it's uncomfortable, where they're being, having to be sacrificial, where they're having to serve, and they're being stretched. And he's stretching them, or he's allowing them to be stretched so they might grow in their faith. You see, where stretching occurs, growth occurs. You see, many of you might have been a Christian for like a long, long time, but you might feel like you haven't really grown a whole lot in your faith. And probably the reason why is that you've never really been stretched. You haven't really said yes. You've never really gotten involved. You've never really kind of signed up to things or, or pushed yourself. And in, in, not just in, in, in faith, not just in Christianity, but in all spheres of life, if we don't stretch ourselves, we don't grow. But where, this, where stretching occurs, growth occurs. Many of you will feel and know, like, well, I haven't really grown all that much, but it's probably because you've never really stretched yourself. You've never really taken a risk. You've never really stepped out there. You've never really kind of said yes and just kind of put your neck out and just, and just gone out on a limb, which often it, it takes that to, um, you know, to, to grow in your faith. I remember when I was about 18 and 19, I was, I was serving in my, in my back home church in, in Bradford. And I'd, I'd spent the week um, kind of serving young people. I was on like a year out, and I was, um, I was like a, a youth worker, and I, was, I spent the, uh, the week kind of being really busy like, with young people. And the weekend came, and I, and I was shattered. Um, and so um, I wanted to kind of go and spend the weekend at my parents and just to chill out. And I think I've told this story before, but hey, preachers only have you know, three good stories, and they tell, tell them all the time anyway. So, um, so I remember, I, remember I, was, I was in my parents' car driving... Uh, uh, go into my parents house to go and spend the weekend with them just to get some downtime just to get some rest because I was tired I just wanted some me time just to try and uh, just to kind of re re recuperate from the week and whilst I was in the car I got a phone call from uh, uh, some parents of a young person in the church uh, and they said Josh you know um, our, our son Peter who you know He's, he's a youth in the, in the, in the church. Um, he's been missing for a few days. He's come back home, but we're so mad at him that we, can't, uh, we, we don't want him to stay at our house. Like, we're just so mad at him that like, we can't have him stay around at our house. So I said, hey, he can come and stay at mine. That's totally fine. So I remember getting, being in the car, I remember arriving at my parents' house, you know, wanting to rest, wanting to just to chill out. I remember getting out of the car, walking straight to the train station, getting the train right back to where I came from, just so like this kid could could come and stay at my house. And that wasn't a big, great thing. You know, I was just willing to serve, but it was sort of like that. I was like, you know, I needed some personal rest and some, kind of, some personal kind of, kind of gratification, but now was not the time. And the same thing was for the disciples. Now wasn't the time. Now wasn't the time just to meet their own needs. Now was the time to serve. And that opportunity might come up in your life as well, where God says, hey, now's not the time for you just to be looking to your own needs and your own desires. 
Now's the time to serve. Just as we have right now, like, I don't know if we've got a camera shot, we've had the camera shot of the food yet. Thank you so much for everyone that's been, been given um, to the Olive Branch and to SafeNet. We're going to be dropping that stuff off tomorrow. But, but just like this, is like, now is not the time just to, just to seek to our own desires and our own needs. Now is the time to serve. Now is the time to be stretched. So they all kind of get there, uh, other side of the lake, uh, and they're ready to, to serve. And, you know, Jesus has a different attitude. The, the disciples might be a bit disgruntled about the crowds are there, but Jesus doesn't. It says, when he saw them, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. That they were like sheep without a shepherd. That they desperately needed teaching. They desperately needed, needed guidance. They desperately needed counsel and leadership as a people. And that's just so like us um, as a society, as a culture, isn't it? It's like that we live in a culture which is just deconstructing some of like the, the, the long-held and firmly held values that we've had for a long, long time. Values like, like, like gender uh, and, and marriage and, uh, and sexuality and, and all these different things and, and objective truth. Things that we, we thought were quite solid before are now just kind of being, um, you know, disassembled. And, and so we don't actually know what's true anymore. We don't really know what's right anymore. We're not, we're not quite sure what's good and, and what's right. And so we need shepherding. We need to submit ourselves to God and say, God, show us what is good. Show us what is right. Show us what is true because we need shepherding. Otherwise, we are like sheep without a shepherd. You know, we have like big media corporations like Facebook and Google which fight for our attention online and wanting us to watch one more video, to watch another advert, to create more, to, to create more money for their advertisers. And, and we live an online life and, and we need... We need shepherding, don't we? We need showing what is right and good and true in life, both corporately and personally. And so Jesus is willing to shepherd them. Jesus is willing to teach them, to lead them, to guide them, that they would submit to his higher power. Okay, so they've been, Jesus is sat there, he's teaching them for hours and hours. The day goes on. Then it says in verse 35, by this time it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he said to them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? So the disciples encounter a problem. Jesus is sat there teaching for hours and hours. It's getting quick, pretty late in the day. It's getting to like eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the evening. Uh, you know, the sun's just kind of, kind of going down. And they're saying, Jesus, hey, it's getting pretty late. These people haven't had anything to eat. It's going to get dark soon. It's going to get, it's going to get safe. These people need to get back to their homes. They've walked miles and miles to come to this place. You know, so, 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 they're, so they're raising you know, like a, a decent problem. They're raising like a, you know, like a rational issue here. And, and Jesus just kind of bounces it back onto them you know, and just raises, the, raises this, um, this crazy kind of statement. He says, hey, you give them something to eat. And they're like, what? Are you crazy, Jesus? We can't give them something to eat. And actually, in the other gospel, it says that Philip actually comes up with the um, amount of money that it would take to feed all the people. So he's like the accountant in the group. He's the nerdy one. So he does, quickly, he does a quick head count. There's so many, so many thousands times by this. What? That would, take, that would take eight months of a man's wages. You know, in today's world, that would, what would be like, I don't know, it depends how much you earn, but you know, 10, 15, 20 grand, I don't know. You know, say... To 10,000 pounds, 15,000 pounds to feed, to feed lunch for a load of people, to feed lunch for thousands of people. It's a lot of money. Nobody has that amount of money to spare unless you're very, very, very wealthy, which these weren't. And so, and so they encounter this problem, and Jesus bounces it back on them, and he says, hey, you give them something to eat. And they come back with an objection. They come back with, 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 a, with, with a point of contention. Hey, Jesus, it can't be done. They come back with a point of possibility and cost. They say, hey, Jesus, it can't be done. It's impossible. I'm not willing to do that. And of cost as well. It costs too much. It's too high. The problem is too big. The cost is too high. And isn't that like how often we respond to God in our lives? That when he's challenging us to do something or when he's putting us in a testing situation, we respond back to him. We object to him with possibility and cost. We say, God, uh, you know, it's not possible. I, I can't do that. I can't do that. I'm too weak. I'm, I'm too vulnerable. I haven't, you know, I haven't learned that yet. I haven't, I'm not bold enough. I'm not brave enough to step out. I'm not brave enough to take on that responsibility yet. Or it costs too high. I'm too busy, God. I'm too busy. I've got too much on my plate right now. Hey, I'll call them next week. Hey, I'll send that email next week. Hey, I'll do what I need to do tomorrow. And we procrastinate, don't we? And we just push it off and we constantly give God an excuse as to why God, why we're not uh, living to the calling that he has called us for. And we say, hey, it's not possible. It costs too much. Yet we know that the reality is, is that to see a move of God in our life often comes with a cost, doesn't it? 
it often comes with a cost. And if you want to see your marriage strengthened, it might come with the cost of not working 60 hours a week so you can actually spend time with your spouse. If you want to see your friendships restored and built back from, from being broken, it might come with the cost of confessing your sin and seeking forgiveness. If you want to see a move of God in your mental health, it might come with the cost of you know, opening up to a close friend or, or seeking guidance and seeking help in, in, in what you're struggling with. You know, if you, want to, if you want to see a move of God in, in, in your own life, if you want to find forgiveness and salvation in God itself, it comes with the cost of giving your life to him. Not all that comes free in this world. And that's true of things, not just practically, but, but kind of spiritually as well, is that there's always a cost. But the, the, the question is, are we willing to pay it? Are we willing to, t- to take a step of faith and say, hey, okay, I'm willing to try it. I'm willing to give it a go. God, test me. So... So they they come back with this question. They say, "Hey, Jesus, it can't be done. It would take eight months of a man's wages." Now, thankfully, Jesus knows what he's already going to do. He's already got a plan up his sleeve. You know, he he's already provided the answer. And so it says in verse thirty-eight, "How many loaves do you have?" He asked. "Go and see." When they found out, they said, five and two fish." Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve basketfuls of broken pieces and of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was five thousand. So we can see that God, uh, well, Jesus, who is God, uh, Jesus um, takes the bread, uh, he takes the fish. Uh, and actually, that, that, that's a point in just there, isn't it? He said, hey, go and find out what you've got. What have you got? And the disciples come back and they say, okay, Jesus, we've got two fish and five, <laughs> and five rolls of bread. And when they say rolls of bread, they don't mean like the tiger loaves, you know, that can feed like a family of six. <laughs> you know, they, they mean like the little, like, uh, ciabatta rolls, something like that. So you've got like five loaves, five little bread rolls, uh, and, and, and two fish. And so even there's a point there in saying, hey, what have you got to work with? What have you got to work with? What's in your hands? What has God already given you? You know, yeah, you might be in a dead-end job. Yeah, you, you might be on a zero-hour con- zero contract. But hey, it's still a job. It's still a great place to start with. So let's be thankful for the things that God has given us in life. So, God, it's a, so Jesus takes these things, uh, and then he, he just starts to distribute them amongst his disciples. So first of all, he, he offers it up to God, and he, and, and he thanks it, he breaks it, then he distributes it amongst his disciples and amongst the crowd. And we have this amazing picture of the gospel, that just as he broke the bread and he distributed it amongst the people, so he will also be broken, and that he will be distributed among the nations. It's a picture of the gospel, isn't it? That Jesus' body would be broken, that, that his blood would be shed, so that all can be blessed, so that all can find satisfaction, so that all can find peace and, and, and to fill that hunger in our soul. And so he, 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 um, he passes the food out amongst the people um, and they were all satisfied. And it says, it says there were 5,000 men. So only, it only counts the men for some reason. Um, but you know, so you can tell that there's probably a lot more people than that. You know, counting women and children, it must have been maybe 15,000, 20,000 people, a lot of people, huge amounts of people, and yet they were all filled and were satisfied. And you see, what's happening here is that Jesus is mimicking God right at the very start of creation. You see, right at the very start, when God exerted his creative power, when he, when he created the earth and the universe, when he created the stars and the moon and the, and the sun and the sky, when he created the water and the mountains and the trees and, and, and the fish in the sea and the, and the animals in the land and the birds in the air, he's exerting his creative power. So Jesus is doing the very same thing here. He's creating. He's, 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 he's creating something out of nothing. Now, some of you might back, say back to me, oh, well, Josh, he, you know, he didn't create it out of nothing. He, he had five loaves and two fish. Well, well, yes, he did have five loaves and two fish, but he didn't give each, one, each person a crumb, and they were miraculously filled, were they? Because it says that they filled up basketfuls of bits left over. So the point being is that he created matter. He exerted his creative divine power, his godly power, and just created uh, food to bless the people. Like his, his divine power, his godly power, his creative power is on display. He's mimicking God's power right at the very start of creation because he is God. He is the Son of God. He is the divine one. I guess the question here, though, is did the, 
did the disciples perceive that? Did they see that? And you see, it wasn't just within his power. Because it says that afterwards they picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces. So to him, you know, doing this miracle wasn't just within his power. It wasn't like he was like screaming at the top of his voice and calling down lightning bolts. And then he like fell back exhausted afterwards. You know, not at all. It was a piece of cake for him. But it wasn't a piece of cake. It was a piece of bread and fish. I guess it was a piece of fish cake, wasn't it? So, but it was a piece of cake for him. It was easy for him. It was easily within his power. It was easily within his, his control. And, and even, um, even both in this story and in the, in the other feeding of the multitude. So Mark records two accounts where Jesus feeds the multitude. There's the feeding of the 5,000, which is here. And then if you've got a Bible, you can just turn over to Mark chapter 8. And there's the feeding of the 4,000. So he does it again. And at the end of, Mark, uh, in, at the end of that scenario, at the end of um, Mark chapter 8, you know, Jesus is talking about these two events, and he's talking about, hey, what did you realize um, in terms of what was left over after each feeding? Okay, so he says in Mark chapter 8, verse 19, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, the story that we're looking at, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? Twelve, they replied. There were 12, pieces, 12 baskets. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, recorded in Mark chapter 8, how many basketfuls of pieces did you pick up? They answered, seven he said to them, do you still not understand? My question to that is, no, I still don't understand. Please tell me more. <laughs> but the point, I think that the, point, the point Jesus was trying to make is that after feeding the, the, the 5,000, there were 12 basketfuls left over. After feeding the 4,000, there were seven basketfuls left over. Now, the numbers 12 and 7 in the Bible are numbers of completion. They're numbers of perfection. So in our kind of culture, in our kind of like the way we do maths, that would be like 10 or 100 or 1,000. It's, like it's like a whole number. It's like a, like a round number. You know, but 12 and 7 were kind of numbers of completion. You know, think 12 months in a year. Think 7 days in a week. So what Jesus is saying is that, hey, um, you know, I did it and I had a complete number left over. As in, like, it was easy. It was easy. It, you know, I didn't, I didn't break a sweat. It was easy. I had, you know, I, it's like if I send you to the shop with a bit of change to go and buy some things, and you come back with ten pounds left over exactly. You, were, you, you know, you had a whole amount left over. You had plenty enough to buy what you needed to buy. That's what Jesus is showing here. It's easily within His power. He's doing this. Ama- he's exerting this amazing creative power, and He can do it easily. The question is, though, is are the disciples getting that? Are the disciples seeing that? Are they, are they receiving Jesus for who he is? Or are, are they still just seeing him as this great godly man, but not the God, not, not the son of God that he really is? That's the question. So now comes the test. So they've, they've just had the lesson. They've just had the lesson, and now comes the test. And this is why we need to read both stories side by side, because if we stopped there, then the, the, then the next bit doesn't really make sense. But we've got to keep on going. So it says in verse 45, straight after this event, Verse 45, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida, whilst he dismissed the crowd. After leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them surfing on, sorry, walking on the lake. He went out to them walking on the lake. So Mark uses the word immediately. So he says, like, hey, straight after this event, Jesus gets his disciples and he whisks them off into a boat and he sends them across the lake. He says, right, okay, guys, I'm going to test you now. And he, and he sends them out across the lake. Now Jesus knows what, what's going to happen. They're going to encounter a storm. That the, that the winds are going to be big. Uh, you know, the waves are going to be strong. That they're going to be, um, you know, they're going to be blowing uh, the, the disciples in the boat. They're going to be um, crashing down on the disciples in the boat. Je- what is Jesus doing? He's sending them into a storm, effectively. He's sending them into a trial. He's going to test them. He's just exerted his power. He's just displayed his glory for them. Now, what are they going to do? He's going to put them in a testing situation and say, what are you going to do? Are you going to depend on me? Are you going to trust in me? Is your faith going to be proven in this moment? It says that he, um, he saw the disciples straining at the oars. Which speaks of his power. You know, Jesus is... Is has my mic gone off? No, that's okay. It, it, Jesus is, is on the mountainside. His disciples are on in a, boat, in a small fishing boat on a lake. It's nighttime. There's no way on earth that he could see them. No way on earth. Even if it was daylight, he couldn't see them. He's so far away, miles away. I mean, who can see a person from miles away? He just can't. But he sees them the way God sees them. He sees them because he's the son of God. He just knows that they're straining at the oars. 
And that Greek word for straining, it, it can also be translated as tormented or, or tortured or buffeted, almost like when a, a boxer is like on the ropes in the ring and his opponent is just dealing blow after blow into his side, into his head. They're being buffeted by the waves, as in the wind of the waves are just buffeting against them, just knocking them from side to side and to, and, and to side. And they're getting really tired, they're getting really stressed, they're getting exhausted. And then it says, about the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them. In your Bibles, it might say, shortly before dawn. So the fourth watch of the night, that's between like 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. They used to split the night into watches so that at least somebody could sleep. So he leaves them like right to the last minute. So basically, the disciples have been struggling in this storm, struggling against the wind and the waves for hours, for like eight hours. They've, just, they've, they've been doing this. So at this point, they're at a point of desperation. They're exhausted. They're tired. They're stressed, you know. Just like how we can get, yeah, just like I've experienced a little bit this week, you know, where, where, where we're, just, we're just at our wits end, when we're at a point of desperation, and then he goes to them. He goes to them in their moment of desperation. What, what, what an amazing picture of grace. I mean, yes, he's testing them at the same time, but hey, he doesn't let them fail. He goes to them in the point of their desperation, just like in our lives. That we might, we might find ourselves in our storm. That storm might be relational. It might be cancer. It might be financial. It might be, it might be something to do with COVID. That you might feel like you're going through a storm right now. You might feel like that storm is lasting for ages. Lasting the entire night. You might feel like it's just going on and going on. And But yet God appears to us. Jesus comes to us in the moment of our desperation. And he's walking on the lake. Again, speaking of his power. So how are the disciples going to react to him? The first test is the storm itself. The second test is seeing Jesus walking on the lake in the middle of a storm. I mean, who would have thought? It's just just crazy, right? So how are they going to react? It says, He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and the wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. So it says that Jesus was about to pass by them. So Jesus is walking on the lake, but he's not walking straight to them. He's not walking like straight in that direction. He's like walking across them. You know, and it's almost as if he's saying, like, oh, hey, guys, you know, just start for an evening stroll or a morning stroll. And it's like he's just going to keep on going. And he's kind of leaving the option open to them. You know, what are they going to do when he presents himself in their situation, when he presents himself in their storm, at the moment of their desperation, what are they going to do? And he's going to leave that, op- that option open to them, just like it does in our life. You know, it says, in, it says in Revelations 3 to the church of Laodicea, Jesus says, hey, I stand at the door and knock. And if anybody opens it to me, I will come in and dine with them and they will dine with me. The point being is that Jesus presents himself in our life, in our situation. He, he offers out his hands of grace, his hands of mercy. And he says, take it if you want. To all who come to me, I will give you life. I will give you satisfaction. I will give you peace. But you've got to come to me as well. And so Jesus is presenting himself in their situation. They look at him and, 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 they, and they say, oh, Jesus, great, come on board. No, they don't do that. They say, blink a neck, it's a ghost. <laughs> you know, they, they think it's a ghost and, they think, and, and they're terrified. They're absolutely terrified by seeing him. And not only that, when the wind dies down, when he gets into the boat, it says they were completely amazed. Now, the NIV translation doesn't really do those words justice because in your translation, it might say something more like... Um, they were utterly astounded uh, and amazed beyond measure. Like utterly astounded and amazed beyond measure, as in like just, they were like just <laughs> flabbergasted. They were flabbergasted that the wind would die down. They were flabbergasted that, the, that Jesus could walk on the water uh, and that everything would just go to peace when he, when he arrived on the scene. And do you know why they didn't understand? Do you know, you know why they, they didn't see Jesus' power? You know why they didn't grasp all that Jesus was at that moment or what he was doing? You know, they didn't really, they just were still thinking that he was just a great godly man. They weren't thinking of him as the son of God. They weren't thinking him of, of as like, you know, God incarnate. They were just thinking of like this great prophet, this great teacher, this great miracle worker. And you know why it says? It says in verse 52, for they had not understood about the loaves, their hearts were hardened. 
You see, they hadn't understood about the loaves. You see, Mark in his gospel, when he, when he writes that, they hadn't understood about the loaves. He's, he's, he's telling us that they were meant to understand something. They were meant to get something. They were meant to comprehend something. They were meant to see Jesus feed the multitude. And they were meant to, you know, the penny was meant to drop. They were meant to, they were, they were meant to get it. They were meant to understand, whoa, this guy is God incarnate. You know, only, only, only God can do this. This guy is of God. You know, he's not just a great miracle worker. He's not just a great teacher. He's not just a great, you know, you know, physician, he is God himself. He, he is the son of God. He is, he is God incarnate. That's what they should have understood. That's what they should have got, but they didn't. Why? Because their hearts were hardened. That's just like us guys, isn't it? Is that we don't fully um, and grasp who God is in our life because our hearts are hard. And, and so when, when we're struggling with our situations, when we're wrestling with our days, when, when we're wrestling with the circumstances and the situations around us, whether it's our, our mental health, or our physical health, or lots of other things, we, we simply just don't take it to God, do we? You know, that you might be struggling with anxiety, but if someone were to ask you, well, have you taken it to Jesus? Have you taken it to God? You might think, well, well not really. You know, I might pray about it. You know, or you might be struggling financially or in, in, in loads of other ways, but yet we just don't go to God. We don't submit to him. We don't, we don't recognize his power. Why? Because our hearts are hard. Because we want to do it in our own strength. We want to do it in our own wisdom. We want to, we want to be able to muscle through and do it for our own, our own glory, isn't it? That's, that's how we find ourselves in, in our lives, is that we don't, we don't realize the power that God has, and we don't accept that power into our life. We don't, we don't trust in that power. We don't give God the faith that he, that he deserves and that we need to give him. Why? Because their hearts were hardened. And I just sometimes wish, I, I sometimes wonder if we're sometimes missing something about who God is, that we're not truly resting on him and trusting in, in him as we should. Jack, I'll have the band up now, thanks. And then, we get to, and then the, the, Jesus and his disciples get to the edge of the lake and they get out of the boat. The storm's finished. The test has been the test is finished with. And they, um, and they get out of the boat and it says in verse 53, when they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to, to let, them, let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. You know the kind of people that really recognize the power that Jesus had? The sick and the broken. Jesus landed, landed in this town called Gennesaret, in this region called Gennesaret, and, and people came to him from all over. They carried the sick on mats, and they said they, they begged just to even touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him, touched him were healed. And it reminds us of that story of the, the woman with the issue of blood, you know, fighting away through the crowds, crawling up to Jesus, saying, if I just touch the edge of his cloak, I will be healed. And she was. And yet that just doesn't just happen once. It happens to every single person who came that day that, that they trusted in Jesus. Why is it that the, pe- that the people who were sick and broken, the people who were, who were hurting, the people who, who had some issues in their life, they could see the power of Jesus. They knew who he was. They, they expressed it very clearly. They just said, hey, I just need to touch the edge of his cloak and I'll be healed. That's the faith that they had in who he was. They recognized his divinity. They recognized his power. And I think it's really because when you've got less in your hands to begin with, it's easier to cling on to Jesus, isn't it? When, you, when, you, when you've got less heartstrings attached to things in the world and the things around you, it's easier to, to attach those to Jesus. It's easier to hold on to Jesus and to recognize his power. When our hands are full of stuff, when our hands are full of riches and wealth and, and distractions and things in life that, that turn us away from God, it's, it, it's longer and it's harder to get rid of all those things and just to hold on to Jesus. That's why Jesus says in the Gospels, it's easier for a camel, like an actual camel, to pass through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Not because he has more sin, but because his heart is attached to the things of his world. The heart is attached to his riches. And you've got to cut those ties off before they can be tied to Jesus. And in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God. Is that when you're, when, you, when you're poor in spirit, when things aren't going, aren't going right for you, that's not always a bad place to be. Because in that moment, in that moment of desperation, you can rely on Jesus like never before. You can experience his power like never before. You can experience his faithfulness like never before. 
And that's, that's been blessed. That's been blessed to do that. And yeah, your situations will be painful. Yeah, the storm will be hard. Yes, the winds and the waves of life and your circumstances and your health and, and your mental health and your relationships might be crashing around you. But in that moment of your desperation, you can have your, your faith in God. You can recognize the power that Jesus has and have that for yourself. So that's, that's a reminder I want to cast out for you guys today. Is that are we really grasping how powerful God is, how awesome he is? And are we absorbing that into our life? Or are we kind of distracted by menial things? You know, and, uh, w- one of the reasons why I think the disciples and the crowds didn't get it. It says later in John 6, when John records this event, the feeding of the 5,000, the people came back after, uh, after being fed. And Jesus says, you do not come back to me because you saw a miracle. You came back because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Essentially, Jesus is saying, hey, you just want another free meal. You know, you, you, you didn't witness the miracle. You didn't see the miracle. You were distracted by the meal. And to be honest, I might have been distracted as well. I mean, think about it. You know, the sun was going down. Mark even reports that they were sat on green grass. It says um, he directed them to have more old people sit down in groups on the green grass. Mark reports the grass was green. Okay, so the sun's going down. They sat on green grass and be given this free meal of bread and fish. Hey, you know, I'd like to sit on green grass at sunset, eating a nice salmon sandwich. Hey, it'd be nice. Nice bit of sweet chili sauce. It'd be lovely. <laughs> it, was, it was a pleasurable experience. It was a good experience. And part of that, they, they couldn't see the miracle. They couldn't see Jesus because they were distracted by the pleasurable experience. Yet those who were broken, those who were hurting, they could easily see him. So let's not be distracted by the things in our life. Yes, all the, all the things in our life are good. All, all the good stuff in our, in, our, in our life is not to be wasted, it's to be used. But let's not distract ourselves. And yes, we want to we wanna, you know, offer a practical blessing. We believe it's important as Christians of the church to meet the real and present and the local needs of the people in our situation. That's why we're doing this. That's why we want to continue to do this. We want to continue to bless people practically. But yet we realize that the greatest need that people has isn't stuff, it's him. Yeah? It's not things, it's him. It's not success, it's him. It's not reputation, it's him. He is the one we need. And so until so we clear out our minds, we clear out our hearts, and we say, God, Jesus, you are all we need. You are all we need. You, are the, you have the power, and I need to depend on you. I need to, to depend on you. Let's stand. We're going to pray, and we're going to worship, and just have an opportunity for you to, to respond and to depend on, on Jesus. Yeah, Lord, we just thank you for your grace. We just thank you for your mercy, God. We just thank you, God, that in the depths of our sin, God, that you reached down, Lord. Uh, you reached your hand down into the depths of our sin, God, into, into our depravity, God, into the muck and the mire and the mess of our situation, God. Lord, and that you brought us out to life, God. Lord, that you gave us a breath of fresh air, Lord. Lord, and I'm sorry, Lord, that I can get so distracted with the things in my life. And I'm so uh, sorry, Lord, that I can try to do things in my own strength and my own wisdom. And I can try to run this race all by myself, Lord. But, Lord, it's it. you, you enjoy it, Lord. And you, and you take pleasure in the fact that we, we depend on you, that we, we, that we put our strength in you, Lord. Lord, that we, we take on your power, we take on your strength, we rely in, on you, Lord, in every situation, in every circumstance, in every trial, in every blessing, God. Lord, that, that you desire to walk alongside us and, and, and to fill us with strength, to fill us with power. So, God, we just recognize all that you are this morning, God, and give us a greater revelation of who you are, God. God, give us that spirit of wisdom and revelation that Paul writes about. So, Lord, so that we might know you better, God. God, reveal uh, yourself to us today, God. Lord, that we might come to you, Lord, in our situations, God, in our brokenness, in our hurting, in our storm. Lord, that you might appear to us. God, we depend on you. We depend on you, Lord. So God, just strengthen us day by day. Lord, that we might, might walk according to your pleasure. That we might live lives that are glorifying to you, God. That we might live lives, God, that are blessed us and are not so self-focused. Lord, we love you. We love you. So God, just be with us by your presence today. In Jesus' name. Amen.